Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kirsty Meddings and I'm a product manager here at Crossref and I'm going to be giving you a brief overview of our Crossmark service, um, what it is, what's new within the service and why if you're a publisher you should participate if you aren't already. Um, we've mentioned in the chat channel but a bit of housekeeping, everyone's on mute just while I run the slides to avoid background noise. Um, but after 15 minutes or so of slides, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So please do type your questions into the questions box um, as we go along, and I'll pick those up at the end. So the Crossmark service is essentially these things. It's a button that publishers place on their website. It's a pop-up box that comes when you press on that button, and it's a set of metadata that tells the reader if there have been any updates to a piece of content that they're looking at, but it also gives them lots of other information, such as funding information, author's ORCID IDs, the publication history, rights or licensing information, and much, much more. I'll start by talking about the key purpose of Crossmark, and that's to let readers know if there are any changes to the status of a particular publication. We know that many things can happen to content after it's been published. It can be corrected, updated, retracted, or even withdrawn. And these things can happen soon after publication, but they can also happen months, sometimes years after publication. So one of the main purposes of Crossmark is to ensure that there's a consistent and reliable way for readers to be notified of these important changes. This is particularly important where PDF copies of articles are concerned. Lots of people download and store PDF copies on their local devices, and then if you go back to reference that article at any given time after that download, you've got no way of knowing if a correction has been issued, unless you take the time to go back to the page that you downloaded it from, which is probably quite unlikely. But if a publisher has added a crossmark button to their PDFs, as this one has in the top left-hand corner, the little circle with the flag in it, you can click on that button from within the PDF, and providing you're online, it'll pop up a web page for you. And this is the crossmark box that it'll pop up, and it gives the latest status of the piece of content. And this statement is what most people will see most of the time, confirmation that the document is up to date, a link a Crossref DOI link back to the publisher maintained copy and a link to the publisher's policies on updates. So this time there are no updates. The box also says that any future updates will be listed below, so encouraging the reader to click when they see um, the Crossmark button. And what this box is doing is checking the Crossref database in real time and pulling back the latest status. So even if this article is several years old, um, the Crossmark box will have current information about anything that's happened to that piece of content since it was published. And it works the same way on web pages. So this is the abstract page of an article, and you can see the Crossmark button here on the top right-hand side, this time with the accompanying text, Check for Updates. This time, clicking on the logo brings up the same pop-up box that we saw before, but this time there has been an update issued for this piece of content. Here it's a correction or corrigendum, and it gives a link there um, in the yellow box to the correction notice. The box changes colour to alert the reader to the fact that there is an update. And again, all I need to do is click on this DOI link to go to that correction notice. Another example, again on a, an abstract page, on online. Um, here the crossmark button is over on the right by the abstract and clicking on this one, this particular article has in fact been retracted. So at this point the box has turned red to highlight this to the reader as a fairly serious update and there's a link in that red box through to the retraction notice. Just to put a little bit of definition about what we mean when we say there's been an update to a piece of content. So to trigger a Crossmark status update, changes to the content have to be significant enough to affect the crediting or the interpretation of the work. And when we're talking about scholarly publishing, there's a limited set of events that meet this criteria. So we've defined a list of these events as follows on the next slide. These are the 12 status update types that can be used in Crossmark. 
So the ones that we consider fall under the definition of affecting the crediting or interpretation of the work. And they were drawn up by a committee made up of our publisher members. So we canvassed quite widely to make sure that we were covering everything that um, is in common use. So there may be other events that could be considered minor updates, so maybe publishing the version of record when an online early or accepted manuscript had been available, or perhaps the addition of comments or replies, but these are not considered significant enough to trigger a warning to the reader via Crossmark. This kind of information can be added to the Crossmark box, of course. Um, there's a more information section, which I'll be showing you in a moment, um, where you can put in notifications of these minor adjustments to the content. But in terms of the actual status update, if you use a term that's not included on this list, the crossmark section of the deposit will be rejected. So the status updates is a really important part of Crossmark, but it's really much, much more than that. It's an opportunity for a publisher to showcase um, a huge wealth of additional metadata within this box. So looking down from the status of the document here, you'll see that there are different sections that can be expanded. So the first one here is the authors section. And we'll pull out the author names and put them into that box. And if you as a publisher are depositing ORCID IDs for your authors, we'll also include those links in this box. So at this point, the reader has the opportunity to jump out and look at the author profile of one of the authors. We'll also pull in any funding information. So if the publisher is depositing funding information for their articles, we will pull that out and display it in the funding section of the Crossmark box. The same applies to um, license information, which is in the section below here. So there's a text and data mining license for this article valid from August 2016. Now, if you're a Crossref member who doesn't um, participate in Crossmark at the moment, but you are already depositing ORCIDs or funding information or license information, this all happens automatically. So if you join up and start participating in Crossmark, um, your backfile information, the authors, the ORCIDs, the funding, the license information will automatically be pulled into the Crossmark box. There's nothing that you need to do to make that happen. So it's a really good way, if you're depositing this information with us, of getting it displayed really nicely in front of your readers. And we've got a new section in the Crossmark box as of, um, I think it was fall last year. Section is clinical trials. And what this does is it shows any clinical trial registration numbers that are mentioned in a paper. And it links together other articles that mention the same trial to create a thread of publications that are reporting on the same clinical trial. And I'll show you how that works. So if you expand the clinical trials section of the Crossmark box, you get a list of the trials that have been discussed in the paper. So in this case, it's a single trial, uh, the one starting NCT here, that's been registered at clinicaltrials.gov, the US government trial registry. This is something that the publisher has sent to us. They've sent us the clinical trial number and the registry as part of their metadata. And when you click to expand that section, you'll see a list of other articles that are also discussing the same trial. So here we've got four articles that are all reporting in some way on a particular clinical trial looking into atrial fibrillation. And these other articles are from different publishers. So at Crossref, we've used the combination of the trial registry name and the trial number to uniquely identify a particular trial in our database. And then we can pull together any other um, DOIs that contain that trial ID. So this Crossmark box um, I got to by clicking on a button on the BMJ journal Heart, but if I click on the top link here uh, in the list of clinical trials, this one, it jumps me over to The Lancet where there is an article that's talking about the same clinical trial. And then we have the Crossmark button on The Lancet article Clicking on that takes me to the same set of data in the Crossmark box on the Lancet. So it's really tying together as much information as possible about this clinical trial across publishers so that researchers can see a, a wide section of reporting about a trial. 
We only started doing this in um, September, October last year, um, and we've got, at the moment got five publishers depositing trial data with us. And so far, only around seven and a half thousand records that contain a trial number. But even within this small data set, we're seeing quite a few examples of these publication threads starting to form. So we're really excited about the potential um, of this part of Crossmark. It could be a huge boost for the transparency of science in this particular area. If you publish in relevant subjects and are interested in getting involved in um, the Link Clinical Trials project, please drop me a line. My contact details will be on the last slide. And then, for any other information that doesn't fit into the categories that I've shown, the funding, the licenses, the clinical trials, there's a more information section in the Crossmark box. And this can take any uh, custom metadata, any information that the publisher or journal wants to show. So in this particular example, they've included the content type, a section on peer review to say that it's been peer reviewed and the process was single blind, the publication history, a link to some supplementary materials, and links out to the copyright statement and licenses. And this is incredibly flexible, this section. So depending on um, different journals or different subjects, there may be different things that you'd like to show to readers in this part of the box, and that can accommodate pretty much anything. It's a really important part of the Crossmark service that all of the metadata, like all of the Crossref metadata, is available in a machine-readable format through our REST API. So anyone, anywhere, can access our API. There's no registration and no login. It's at the address over here on the left. And it's an incredibly powerful tool. You can do all kinds of queries to pull back all kinds of metadata. So here I've looked for all of the works that we have that have got a clinical trial number in them. And that's the returned that information to me in a machine readable format. Now this opens up some quite interesting possibilities for propagating this metadata, which we um, are really very keen to do through our API. That's, that's the reason it exists. So one example could be that publishers could use that API to look up um, the DOIs of articles in their references and then pull back any updates to flag them alongside those references. This is just a mock-up, obviously, um, but that seems like quite a good service to readers. And by putting the Crossmark button on PDFs, publishers can ensure that wherever those PDFs go, status updates will follow and there'll always be a link back to the definitive copy on the publisher's website. So if readers post those um, PDFs in bibliographic management systems, uh, upload into places like Mendeley, the cross mark within that will ensure that no matter where the PDF is, it always have a link through to any updates that happen and a link back to the publisher's copy. I'm not going to go into the detail in this webinar today about what you need to do to participate in Crossmark. Um, I'll give you a link at the end. Uh, that takes you to uh, the technical side of things. But I'll just touch on these best practices. So any Crossref member in good standing can participate in Crossmark. We do ask that if you're going to deposit, you deposit good quality and comprehensive metadata so that the Crossmark box is well populated. So while depositing funding data and ORCIDs and so on are, are absolutely not a requirement, we really do encourage you to deposit these metadata. You need to commit to displaying the crossmark button next to the article title and in your PDFs. And also, of course, you need to commit to timely updates if any of your content does change. There are some additional charges for crossmark. On top of your dollar deposit fees, there's a 20 cent fee for current content and two cents for back file, which is anything older than two years old. In September last year, we released a new version of Crossmark, um, version 2.0, um, and it had a, quite a, an impressive set of improvements to version 1.5, which was the previous. So we've redesigned the button to make it look much more modern and much more like a button that people can click on. Quite critically, the Crossmark 2.0 box is mobile responsive, so no matter which device you're looking on and what kind of small screen, it will look good and be readable. The code behind the service is much more compatible. We had run into a few issues with some previous versions. And we announced this to all those who are participating in Crossmark in September and also said that after the end of March 2017, we're not going to support version 1.5. It will continue to work, but we're not going to be offering um, technical support if anyone runs into any issues with that. 
So if you are a Crossmark participant and you haven't upgraded to 2.0 yet, it's really very easy to do so. There's a little snippet of code to drop into your landing pages, which you can get here, and then you just need to decide which shape and size of button you want. So it's as simple as that, a really um, easy change to make to get all of the benefits of version 2.0. So just before I finish, I'll just let you know um, where we're at with Crossmark. There are 4.5 million um, DOIs that have got Crossmark information. So there are 4.5 million Crossmark buttons out there on pieces of content. These come from 370 different publishers. And within those uh, Crossmark deposits, there are 43,000 status updates, of which 1,500 are retractions and just over 40,000 are corrections. And two and a half million of those DOIs have additional metadata, so things that populate that more information box. And that, in just under 15 minutes, brings me to the end of my slides. Uh, this is the URL on our website for more information about Crossmark, and it also links out to the technical information, and these are my contact details. And I'm very happy to take any questions now. Question come in already, which is a very good one. If there's no funding information, for example, will that section heading still appear? No. If you're not depositing funding data, then the funding section won't show. Those are the, the sections that appear are triggered by the metadata that's been deposited. I'll give a minute or two for anyone who's typing a question. We are um, recording today's presentation and we'll send you out a link to both the recording and to the slide deck as well. So feel, please feel free to share that amongst your colleagues. Any other questions from anybody? Ah, I have a question about whether there is a plugin or utilization for op Open Journal System, OJS. Another very good question. At the moment, there isn't, um, but we were talking with PKP who run OJS uh, just a couple of days ago, and what we're hoping is that at their meeting in the summer, Crossmark integration is going to uh, be one of the subjects for their hackathon to try and move that forward. Um, there are a couple of other priorities for Crossref and OJS integration at the moment, one of which is depositing references, um, but Crossmark is very much on their radar, and we are very committed to helping them get that set up, um, hopefully this year. Any other questions from anybody? If you think of anything afterwards, of course, you please also feel free um, to email me. I have a question here. What happens if an article changes its DOI number after it's published? That's quite an interesting question um, because one of the, the key things about the DOI is that once it's been issued, um, it shouldn't be changed for a particular work. That I may be misreading your question or taking it out of context. Um, generally, if you have to change a DOI, which we strongly encourage that you don't, um, a new DOI will be aliased to the old one, so it shouldn't actually affect Crossmark in any way. Um, but as I say, we do strongly discourage changing DOIs for works once they have been published. Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything else um, pop into the questions box, so please email me if you think of anything afterwards. And otherwise, I'll just say thank you very much for joining us today. Goodbye.